Okay, so on to the final presentation of this particular session, and um, I'm delighted to uh, introduce Jake Klein to you. I think many of you will know Jake uh, because he was particularly successful, and I think it's fair to say he was one of the pioneers going into China, and he built uh, a very successful company, Sino Gold Mining, which was uh, sold for more than $2 billion back in 2009. Um, by way of introduction to Evolution Mining, where Jake Klein is the executive chairman, this was formed last year through the merger of Conquest Mining and uh, Cat Catalpa Resources, along with the acquisition of a couple of mines from Newcrest, Krakow, and Mount Rawdon. Um, I think it's fair to say, and a number of us have noticed, that there is a, uh, a gap in the, in the Australian gold sector for uh, mid-tier uh, company with uh, two or three or more operations. In the case of Evolution, it's got four producing mines and a fifth that's currently being developed. Uh, it's capitalized at just over a billion dollars, which gives you some idea of the size of the business that's been put together. And uh, Jake, we're looking forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Mick. Uh, afternoon, everyone. It's great to be back at Diggers. Uh, I have a lot to tell you, so I'm gonna launch into it fairly quickly. Remember, we were only formed eight months ago and already with the fourth largest gold producer in Australia listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. Um, so a quick snapshot of where, who we are. Um, as Mick said, we're a $1.1 billion uh, market cap, uh, good liquidity, uh, around $1.7 million a day, uh, good cash position, $142 million in the bank, uh, low level of debt, uh, and I think a key competitive, competitive advantage for us uh, is the cornerstone support we've received from Newcrest. Uh, remember, Newcrest uh, had the option of selling these assets for cash. Uh, they decided, uh, and we're really co-architects in the creation of Evolution, they decided not to take a dollar off the table during the deal consummation and have retained their full upside to this, this story and this strategy which we've put together with them uh, and uh, what is the Evolution story. I think before launching into the nuts and bolts of evolution, which I'll get to, I wanted to give you a, a perspective for, from our side as to how we see the industry unfolding, because I think it will give you a good sense of why we created evolution. Uh, but more importantly, uh, we think we're at an inflection point in the Australian gold sector, which we haven't seen since the mid-1990s. Uh, we think the next three years, uh, for different reasons, are going to see fundamental changes in the Australian gold industry. And uh, in many ways, we look forward as evolution to being somewhat of a front runner or forerunner uh, in that change which is occurring. You know, should we be panicking about the gold price? I, I don't think so. Uh, the gold price is pretty steady uh, from last year. In fact, I think this uh, recent correction is, is quite healthy. We should put it in the context uh, of the 2008 correction where gold was only $800 and look at its increase since then. Um, you know, the, the fundamentals of gold are strong. Supply is pretty much flat, uh, more difficult to find uh, decent deposits. Uh, central banks are still buyers. In fact, the range of central banks uh, which are buying gold are, are increasing and you know, you've, got to, you've got to believe that China with only 2% of its, current foreign, its foreign currency reserves in uh, in gold is a natural buyer into any weakness of gold. Uh, the public sector debt, which you heard about this morning in the keynote address, is uh, worse uh, than it was 12 months ago. So, you know, against this backdrop, I don't think we as gold miners uh, should worry too much about the gold price. In fact, I think we should, as I said earlier, see this as a healthy correction. We should be much more panicked about this slide. Um, which shows uh, the gold industry's relative share price performance against the gold price. Um, you know, in recent meetings I've had with investors, uh, their frustration, anger, anxiety is palpable. Investor relations and investor meetings is becoming less pleasant by the day. Um, but when you think about it, I guess it's, it's pretty fair because, I mean, we're talking to people generally as gold miners. We're talking to people who've been smart enough to tell their investors uh, about the likely gold price rally, um, and they've been right uh, over time. Uh, and yet they've seen absolutely dismal returns um, in, in their equity prices and equity portfolio. So in spite of this rally in gold prices, you know, st uh, portfolios are down anywhere between 10 and 60% off their 52-week highs, and in some cases, even more. 
I guess the impact of this is uh, fairly predictable. I mean, we have, as, as gold companies over the last few years, uh, lived in a very forgiving market. Investors have been remarkably forgiving. Um, they've, capital has been cheap and easy. Uh, but as you can see, uh, that is changing. And I think in many ways, um, you know, it's a new world we live in. But I think before we look at you know, what does that new world look, at, look like, we thought we'd have a stab at trying to identify you know, what is weighing gold stocks down. The first thing we'd say that just like in the credit crisis of 2009 where credit risk was mispriced, we would say that political risk is currently being mispriced. Uh, resource nationalism is an ever recurrent theme in the supposedly hot mining de destinations and investors are really being blindsided in some cases by massive losses in the value of their assets or, or their, their investments, you know, with stocks down to up to 80% uh, in certain jurisdictions. Indonesia, Argentina, Kyrgyzstan, I mean, the, the list goes on and on, uh, are all countries who have caused investors significant pain and suffering. Uh, and I hear something which I guess uh, we should be uh, more culpable or take more culpability for, uh, capital blowouts. I mean, that's, that's the reality of the industry. You've seen Barrick, the lo world's largest gold miner, uh, say that Pascalama, uh, one of the world's largest developments, uh, had their capital has increased 50 to 60 percent off the top side of their capital estimate of five billion dollars. So it's up two and a half billion. They actually went as far, so far as to try and identify what the issues were. They said lower than expected contract to productivity, 30 percent, engineering and planning, 25 percent, uh, cost escalation, 25%, schedule extension. Sound familiar? I mean, I think the truth is that 75% of a major uh, Australia gas, oil, resource projects uh, have cost or schedule overruns of more than 25%. It's something we're going to really have to change and get better at. Nick Holland, in a uh, speech to the Melbourne Mining Club, highlighted this, and I think it's, it is a real issue. You know, 40, he said that between 2007 and 2011, 40% of the major gold miners, and they're the better lot, did not meet annual production guidance within a 5% tolerance level. Um, and you know, that, again, is just not good enough. Macquarie, in a note to clients, said, um, and I'm quoting this, we forecast most gold companies we cover will miss second quarter 2012 consensus EPS estimates, we also see potential for a number of negative project guidance revisions and possible higher profile write downs. This stuff does not fill investors with a lot of confidence. Good news, as you've probably seen and lived through, is being accepted without much fanfare. Bad news is absolutely being punished severely. So if you believe that and you say, well, what is this new environment we live in? Capital's becoming much more expensive. Uh, what is going to happen? Well, again, we'd take a, a stab at saying what we see the outlook as. Uh, we think political risk will be better priced. And from an Australian perspective, we think Australia will in time again command a premium like they used to, like we used to. Australia does not really have political risk. We have almost political noise. And it is fair to say that over the past two years, we've probably done our best at portraying ourselves to international investors in the worst possible light. But it's really not political risk. You know, minority governments, carbon taxes, mineral resource taxes, we spoke about it, but it's all priced in. At the end of the day, Australia is a vast, highly mineralized, lowly populated, resource-friendly country. So we see that as being an improvement in the rating of Australia. Capital discipline is obviously going to be a key focus. Uh, mining companies need to start focusing on that. You're seeing the majors start to talk about it. Uh, you're starting to hear about this word, dividends. Yeah, we're going to have to start paying returns back to shareholders. And lastly, you know, it's, going to be more it's going to become increasingly difficult as investors become more selective, equity gets more expensive, debt providers become more expensive and more selective, it is going to be increasingly difficult to run single asset companies. And you know, we see this phase as being a consolidation phase. Again, going back to what I said earlier, 
To us, it's similar to what's happened in the mid-90s. Uh, the high Australian dollar, I think, is going to mean that offshore players are potentially divesters of assets rather than acquirers of assets. But the same fundamental change in the gold industry has to occur. Because when you look at this chart, and clearly Newcrest is the, is the standout. I think it represents, someone mentioned this morning, over 50% of the market capitalization of the Australian gold space. Um, but there's two other things which you'd, which you'd recognize or see in this chart. One is that there are really no mid-tier gold companies in the global sense. You know, global sense, I'm talking about 400 to 800,000 ounces of gold production, uh, real growth, a market capitalization of somewhere in the order of four to eight billion dollars. We don't have any of those which are what you'd put as global mid-tiers. Second is the long tail. We have so many small, single assets, uh, low market capitalization companies. And uh, we think investors are really both going to demand and require change to occur. So it's going to be driven by market forces. And where do you want to be in this period of change? Well, empirically, the mid-tier space has been the one that has delivered the best returns. And I, I don't think there's any rocket science to this. You know, Mid-tiers have the technical depth to deliver on their promises, the critical mass to attract and retain the best staff, the financial strength to properly capitalize and invest in its asset, and yet are able to maintain that essential entrepreneurial spirit and capacity to deliver on meaningful growth. And that's why and how we've positioned evolution. The opportunity unfolding here in front of us is fantastic. And in many ways, we did, we did this deal at Evolution, as, as I said, for this opportunity. Uh, we, we believe that um, you know, you've seen deals happen today, you've seen deals happen over the next, last few months, uh, that consolidation is going to be a theme and uh, Evolution is going to play an important uh, and leading role in that. So let's get down to the nuts and bolts of Evolution, because as I said, we are already the fourth largest gold producer in Australia. Um, I think importantly, we, all our assets are 100% owned. Um, it does make it a lot e easier. Um, excellent exploration potential at each of our assets. I mean, when we describe these assets, one of the comments we get back uh, is these assets are a bunch of tired assets that you've put together. Wrong. At every one of these mines, we believe there is significant exploration upside. These are not mines which have been taken out of care and maintenance. They have been mines which have been operating since they've been started up, and we are mining fresh reserves at each of these mines. We've got three and a half million ounces of ore reserves, 7.1 million ounces of mineral resources, and we have a very defined growth profile both at Mount Carlton, organic and organic growth through a significant exploration program. We're forecasting a uh, production of between 370 and 410,000 ounces of gold equivalents uh, this year, financial year 2013, and we see as the ramp up of Mount Carlton takes, takes place through the second half of the financial year 2013, that production brace will grow into financial year 2014. So how have we gone in the last nine months? We've released three quarterly reports. Uh, I mean, I think we've been in a, in a position, a, a remarkable position, uh, where we've been able to say that on all occasions we've met production guidance. Uh, in fact, our total production guidance for the year, 346,000 ounces on a 100% basis, was within guidance, and uh, average cost of production was below guidance, which, you know, terrific results, and I think demonstrates the fundamental rationale of managing a portfolio of assets. In each of the quarters, you saw different one of our, a different one of our assets delivering. Uh, and we see that as a real benefit of being evolution. So let me take you through the assets uh, very briefly. Um, Krako, um, it's been operating since 2004. It's got a remarkably consistent and reliable track record of production. We're estimating between 90 and 100,000 ounces of production from Cracker next year. Um, and, uh, you know, it started its mine life with about a five-year mine life. It's still got a five-year mine life. And I expect, if I am presenting at Diggers in five years' time, the 25th anniversary, uh, it'll have a five-year mine life then as well. Um, Pajinga, it's been a great turnaround story. We've, uh, we've operated this mine for about uh, 18 months or 20 months. 
uh, in the financial year 2011, where we took the asset over about six months before year end, it produced 45,000 ounces of gold. Uh, this last year, where we had 100% of it for the whole year, it produced 75,000 ounces, and we're forecasting 85 to 90,000 ounces of gold. So again, I hope that gives you a sense uh, that these assets are better off in a portfolio which has the capacity to fund, the, fund them to their, to their optimal potential. The only issue with Pajinga, this is a field that has produced 2.6 million ounces to date, is that it didn't have any money uh, and it was starved of capital and we were able to bring that capital and bring some momentum to the production base. Edna May, well here's another example of a turnaround underway. Uh, we're focusing on reducing costs. I think it was as in Catalpa's hands in an undercapitalized uh, vehicle, an undercapitalized situation. Uh, we've had our best month ever this last month, and we recognize that whilst one month doesn't make the summer, uh, it's certainly uh, good to get good news out of Edna May. Financial year 2013 outlook, 75 to 80,000 ounces of production uh, at a cash cost of around 840 to $890. The key to Edna May uh, is increasing throughput. Uh, we have been uh, somewhat uh, uh, limited by throughput capacity and reliability of the plant. We're working on the reliability aspect, but really to make this work, you have to go above 3 million tons. It's cu currently operating at 2.6 million tons. Uh, we focused on that and we expect, uh, we're doing some studies, there are positive results, and we expect that this mine will be able to be turned around in due course. Mount Rawdon, a great and consistent producer. I mean, I think it's produced uh, you know, close to 100,000 ounces, 80 to 100,000 ounces for its full eight-year life to date. It only started, I think, with the five-year mine life. It's got eight years ahead of it. We see significant exploration upside at this mine. Uh, it produced 95,000 ounces at a cash cost of $684 an ounce uh, and at last year, and we expect it to produce 95 to 110,000 ounces at a cash cost of 600 to 660. I hope this is giving you the impression of the life and the, the upside to these assets. Because um, here's the growth asset. This, this asset was only discovered in 2006. It's in Queensland. Um, $145 million uh, development uh, on schedule for commissioning by the end of this year. Um, and, and, and this recognizes that you know, cash costs are important, operating costs, and reducing your, your, your your, uh, your operating costs, increasing the quality of the portfolio. Mount Carlton will certainly do that for us because once it's fully ramped up in the 2014 financial year, this asset will be the lowest cost mine in our portfolio. But what about exploration and discovery? Um, we have five projects in multi-million ounce uh, provinces. Uh, we have a very large land position. Uh, and importantly, we have the financial strength to stick with an exploration strategy. This year, we're expecting to spend $28 million in and around our, our mines, uh, and we're drilling more than 100,000 meters. So you know, we're absolutely committed. We see the upside. Um, in fact, the drill rigs are turning now. Um, even though we're at the early stages of this exploration strategy, uh, we're starting to see some really encouraging um, early stage results. Um, and certainly there's a, there's, a, there's a significant skip in the feet of um, our geologists at the moment. Um, you know, what the plan is, and, and I think you've seen slides like this before, but the plan is to move these prospects through um, and, and deliver uh, organic growth through this exploration um, program and also look for transformational targets uh, which we do believe have the potential to exist on our properties. So we've talked about organic growth uh, through uh, funded, well-funded exploration. Um, we do see opportunities in this market for opportunistic um, acquisitions. Uh, we think debt and equity markets are not getting easier. Uh, and we do see that whilst values have come back a long way, uh, we're not certain that this is the end of that value derating. Um, so we also recognize that investors require us and will demand us, if we were to do an acquisition, to be able to very clearly articulate uh, and demonstrate why this acquisition uh, is accretive and positive for evolution. 
We also believe that the Newcrest relationship is a key competitive advantage, not just as a shareholder, but Newcrest is without doubt one of the world's leading gold companies. Their intellectual knowledge is you know, amongst the best in the world, if not the best, uh, and a company of the size of Evolution's capacity to tap into that intellectual knowledge um, gives us, I believe, a remarkable and key competitive advantage. I'd have to say that the relationship with Newcrest over the first nine months and through the deal consummation or, or deal negotiation, which probably took uh, six to nine months as well, has been far exceeded our expectations. Uh, Newcrest have been outstanding at their support, uh, technically uh, assisting us uh, where they can, uh, and there's no formal relationship exists, uh, that exists, but they clearly demonstrate that through an ongoing commitment to evolution. I mean, ideally, you know, what would we love to find? We would love to find something uh, that Newcrest ticked the boxes with respect to, yes, they like the geology, uh, yes, they could do business in that part of the world, but no, it doesn't meet the size threshold for Newcrest, which, remember, their size threshold has gone up substantially since they found the 40 million Wafu Golpu deposits. So that really wraps up evolution as to where we're at. We think we are growing and building, and we're on, on the road to building a globally competitive mid-tier. Uh, we see ourselves delivering those two key things which investors have been demanding, operational predictability and meaningful growth. Uh, and uh, you know, we think we are at the right place, at the right time, at a time of real change in the Australian gold sector. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Jake. Um, we have time for one or two quick questions, please. So there's a good number of you here in the audience, uh, obviously keen to hear what Jake had to say. Has he covered everything? Sorry, Keith, I beg your pardon, couldn't see. Hi, Jake. Um, just the, the usual quick three. Um, so firstly, what do you expect... Mount one at a time, I haven't got a pair. All right, we can, we, we, we can do this one at a time. Firstly, what do you expect Mount Carlton's cash cost to be in financial year 14? And what production would that be at? I think on a byproduct basis, it's uh, sub six, sub five hundred and fifty dollars an ounce. Um, so taking the silver and copper credits, and I think that's at sixty to seventy thousand ounces of uh, of gold production. Okay. Um, second one is: uh, Are you still planning on mining underground at Edna May, and if so, when? Well, we said that the Edna May strategy was was clear. First, we needed to get the plant operating reliably. We're making progress with that. Second, we wanted to look at upside in terms of scale and throughput to the Edna May uh, plant because the, the mine is effect we're effectively ore bound in the mine, so ore is not an issue. Um, the key sort of shift we've had with respect to underground is that we don't think a small, narrow vein underground uh, is the best option. Uh, so we're turning our thinking towards more of a bulk approach uh, because remember the Edna May deeper section, which we, uh, is really exactly the same as the upper section, which we're mining in the pit, except it's got a very high-grade, narrow section. Um, so, you know, we're looking at, and it's very early, Keith, uh, at early stages of bulk mining the underground. And the final one, what is Evolution's dividend policy, and when do you expect to pay your first dividend? <laughs> um, that's a question that the board has asked me several times, um, and appropriately, and shareholders. Um, we have a, a meeting on the 28th of August when we release our um, financial results. Um, look, we, we are keen to pay a dividend. Um, that said, we will make that decision in the context of our balance sheets and, and ability to not, I mean, the worst possible situation is, being, is paying a dividend and then needing more money. We think we've got a strong financial position, so it's well and truly on the agenda. Um, whilst this dividend may be small, um, if it's paid, uh, we certainly recognise that increasing dividends is something that investors are going to seek, and we look forward to paying it. Thanks, Jake. Excellent. Uh, give everybody an opportunity. No, I think we're about done, Jake. Okay. Excellent. Thanks very much for a very good presentation. Thank you.